Mike Realm, thank you so much for joining me on Culture Chat today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. You're my first DJ, like a legit DJ. Really? <laughs> yes. I feel well, I feel like everyone is a DJ these days, so it's like <laughs> By default, you've had 30 DJs already. <laughs> well, you know, I've got <laughs> iTunes. That totally counts, right? Uh, Yeah. <laughs> no, like you are a legit DJ. I've seen some of your videos and you're like rocking it out. And it's really cool because you've even got like the, the turntable thing. I can't wait to talk mm -hmm. to you about the whole evolution of it because you actually did probably start when there were records. That thing we have to explain to like millennials and the teens now what those were. But um, but, <laughs> but I'm sure you actually have gotten God. to use those. Um, and I've heard you describe the turntables as your instrument. And um, mm -hmm. so I want to know all about it. I want to know how you got started and how you gravitated towards the the instrument that is the turntables for you. Uh, well, I started DJing in, I was 15. And that was probably right before the kind of explosion for, you know, because when I started, it was like, okay, you could, you could DJ at clubs, you could DJ at weddings or DJ on the radio. And that was pretty much it. You know what I mean? So for us, it was like you had to really love the craft and love the music. You know, I was I love hip hop. I still do, obviously. But, you know, that that's what drew me into it was uh, hip hop music because you hear scratching and stuff. It's like, what, what is that? Because I can't rap. So <laughs> I can I think I can do that thing, that sound that that's going on. And, it, you know, by then it, it was just like it was kind of a normal thing to have on a on a, a song it was like scratching so it's like okay i want to be that guy i just want to be you know just scratch records it sounds like fun i didn't know how to, i mean i learned how to play piano when i was younger uh because i'm chinese <laughs> but but uh that was pretty much it you know as far as like musical training so uh it, it, when i saw what people were doing with with records it was just like, oh my god, this is like a this is like an alien language. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you said fifteen, and and because I have had the pleasure of speaking to you before, I'm not gonna totally reveal your age, but like you know that means <laughs> that means you really started to kind of take up the craft, like in the nineties, right? And nineteen ninety three, yes. For me, nineteen ninety three, and that, that is like for me, what is the golden age of hip hop? Like oh, yeah. that is the, you know, and now, now we're going to have a whole nother conversation because you're out on the West coast and I consider to mm -hmm. be like a very East coast type of a uh, hip hop. Okay. Uh, um, you're what, you're one of those. I am one I of see. those. Yeah. 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 But I have love for all hip hop. Like I have much respect for uh, some West coast artists. I'm actually one of the You few. said some, you said some. I said some. I did say some. I, I mean, you know, especially looking at now to 93, like, you know, I would love like if Tupac were around right now compared to oh, what's yeah, going all on would. and we all would. Yeah. So, but I mean, 93, 92, I mean, we're talking like the best albums to me, you know, is what kind mm -hmm. of like launched the whole era of that next era. Like, you know, you go 80s and we're talking like, you know, old school, like, you know, grandfathers of hip hop type deal. Mm -hmm. But now you got to kind of like... um jump in when it was when it was to me what is like the hip-hop era so what were before we keep going down your little path here what were some mm -hmm. of the sounds that you heard the scratching that you kind of wanted to emulate what were some of the artists that you kind of um you know listened to and was like this is this is what i want to do ah uh so dj premiere for sure yeah he consistently scratched i mean he would scratch the hooks it would just be like this is a centerpiece of the song you know right. what I mean? Like, and of course, you know, he's making the beat. So it's just, it, it just kind of all comes together. Um, I think a lot of people's first exposure to scratching was uh, Rocket. Okay. Herbie Hancock's Rocket. Yep. Herbie Hancock, was, right? Yeah. So it was just like, and that was like, that was an, in, that was the instrument. Okay. You know, that, that like, along with every other sound on there that fit, it just fits. It was just the perfect song the perfect introduction to scratching okay i think yeah well uh, see now now we already have love for each other because i mean we're talking gangstar we're talking yeah about, yeah you know so even though you're on the west coast right like <laughs> there, we found a bridge already you know There's have i bridge. proven myself to you <laughs> 
need to prove anything to me because yes. I have actually <laughs> seen you in action and I will I will link it here for everybody to see but you've got these really cool mixes of like video and film which we're definitely going to talk about later but yeah mm -hmm. so so a lot of people, like you said, I think I saw like a little uh, teaser where you're like talking about your craft, you know, like people kind of diss the fact that you believe it to be an instrument. Can you kind of talk a little bit more to like where people just think, oh, all you do is play two records and they mm -hmm. kind of like mash up and like, but I know that I couldn't do it. You know, like, well, I mean, right, I guess right, if right. I practiced really hard, I know I won't be, I'm not willing to put in the time for that, but it is definitively. And those who know, like, yeah, you look at DJ Premier and you're like, okay, we're here, you know, mm -hmm. and then you have the wedding DJs yeah, <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah. are actually just, which, which isn't bad, but I'm it's a craft in itself. It like if you see a good wedding DJ and tough, that, yes. that person is going out there, they're, they're working the crowd and doing all like that. I couldn't do that. So. <laughs> right. But yeah. it's, it's a different animal. Right. So that's all. I mean, sure. it's kind of sad, though. Like some of that is like you could just have a good MC and like an iTunes playlist now. And mm -hmm. like that DJ mm -hmm. kind of gets replaced. Like whereas yeah. to yeah. do what you do uh, is a whole nother ball game. Yeah. And that's to me, that was just sort of like um, just self-preservation. You know what I mean? Because I see I saw it come in with like when when. People were carrying around iPods and just popping them in. I'm like, okay, wait. So I need to be not replaceable by that thing because a lot of people come to a party expecting to be able to go. And they still do this. You know, they'll go up to a DJ, you know, have a, they'll just open their notes in their phone and just like type out all their favorite songs and then hold up the phone uh to to the per, to the dj's face and it's like i see this happening i'm like oh my god this is painful to watch like how dare you this is just that's just insulting you know first of all like you never like you're a stranger i'm I'm gonna hold up hey do this for me on this what what i type play this like yo can we have a conversation first like what is, <laughs> what is this hi <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, yes, yes. Like well, I, and I think it's because, like, this is, like, kind of a age in music where it is a playlist age. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, you yeah. just, like, well, I only want to hear this. I can, you know, back in the day when we had to listen to the radio live, like, this is even mm. before satellite radio people where mm -hmm. you only had FM AM. Uh, you couldn't skip the song unless you recorded it on your cassettes. And, yeah. then, <laughs> and then even that was like, hit the fast forward button, you know, you, and then you had to guess, you know, but like, yeah. it was, there was that, the, it, I call it like the, to analogize to a video, like, you know, there was, before there was Netflix, we had to, and DVRs, we actually had to watch <laughs> things in real time. So, you know, I think there's that spoiled mentality of like, well, I get what I want and when I want it now. And I only want to hear, yeah, you yeah. know, what I want. And so there, there's yeah. a specific difference to how we listen to music now. Totally. And they're just used to, it. I don't, I don't blame them for having that sense of, uh, it's kind of a sense of entitlement, but it's a sense of like, that's just kind of, they're, they're just used to it. Like uh, if I type, this word i get this song if i click this here this plays for me and i and i am happy you know we're totally programmed that way and i'm sure i'm programmed in, you know for netflix or youtube or whatever like it yeah. just that's just kind of how it is right it's weird. and so you though have been able to actually make this like your career mm-hmm I mean, that's yeah. kind of amazing. I mean, let's just think about instruments and artists in general. Like, say you stuck with the piano. Uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't the, the percentage, I'm sure, I, I haven't done statistics, but it's hard to be a pianist or a, you know, flautist or, you know, like it's hard to actually go, oh, okay, I play this instrument. I loved it through school. I, I was mm -hmm. disciplined. And then as you grow up, most musicians realize that it's the starving artist thing, you know, and then now you've made a living and, um, and have been very successful in your own right with a lot of the things that you do. I'd love for you to talk about and share with our audience, but like doing DJ work and not just like being like, you know, the, uh, Adam Sandler, like the best wedding singer guy ever. Like yeah, you yeah. actually are like <laughs> spinning the turntables, you know? So yeah. I mean, how hard was that? That was difficult. Well, again, it was difficult because when I started, there wasn't, it wasn't like you could say, well, look at this person. This person is playing, you know, festivals with a hundred thousand people there and making millions of dollars. So there is, 
at least, you know, that kind of path that you can follow and try to attain. But so again, like for the first maybe five or six years, it really was about the love of it. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't making any, like what money did not come into play for a long time. I mean, till the bills pain- started. <laughs> oh God, for a painfully long time. And you know, when I started seeing my, my friends, uh, you know, having their careers and, and buying their things. And I'm like, wait, should I be doing that? Or what is, hold on, you know, but you got to kind of push through it because there's something, you know, I figure I, I've, I've, I've come this far and, and at one, at some point, you know, if you're a creative person, you probably have felt this, there's everyone comes to that moment where it's like, well, I've, I've come this far. Like, what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. And luckily for me, the opportunities grew as I grew. So when I was in college, a lot of, uh, just more opportunities came, you know, like, like I started traveling outside of California. I remember my first gig outside of the state. I was like, Oh my God, this is, what am I doing? This is crazy. And it was in Portland. Do you know what I mean? Like two hours away. (laughs) Like, but I still cross state borders. Yeah, to play that, a gig. like somebody somebody found me and booked me to play a gig. Right, this is amazing. I could do this forever. Uh, so I just kind of kept going with it because it just felt like, even though again, you know, monetarily it wasn't like the best thing in the world. It just felt like, ah, uh, you know, there's some there's there's enough here that kind of uh, fulfills my my, uh, my soul. I guess that's kind of the best way to put it. Be- it, it just something just kind of makes you keep going. Like it's super hard to describe. Um, and it is tough because again, like that was also a time when, you know, a lot of people were, were downplaying the whole turntable as an instrument thing, because that was when I remember uh, for a few years, it was, there's this, there's this, um, there's this convention called NAM. I think it stands for North American music market. Um, it's huge. So every, all the, the instrument makers and and a lot of bands go out there and everyone it's just a meeting of all you know at the Anaheim Convention Center uh, just a huge convention for for musicians and there was there's always the uh, the guitar guys versus the turntable guys and it's like oh this is they're just scratching records this is not sound they're they're not even making their own music they're just taking other people's stuff and it's like well yeah but <laughs> that's and that's part of the art you know what I mean like we we don't have our own instruments. We don't play our, you know, not everyone can play the trumpet where I live. And I don't know like an amazing concert pianist or a a ridiculous drummer. Um, So I'm going to sample it and I'm going to manipulate it in this way. And it's, it's, it's own thing. Um, So there was a little bit of a disconnect for a long time. I think it's gotten a lot better. So I've played with a lot of bands and, and, you know, DJs have been incorporated into just uh, music in that way, which I think is amazing because that's that was kind of always what we saw, you know, because, like, you know, growing up with other turntablists, it's like, oh, wait, no, I could I could be the drummer, you know, and mm-hmm. I'll scratch the drums or I could be the you know, you you be the lead uh, guitar. You do the solo or whatever, you know, uh, and so we would structure our little our little jams in that way. Like, okay, you're the percussion and you're the, you know, this, whatever. Um, and kind of make our own thing. So it's kind of interesting too. I was just thinking about like DJ, right? Like, so ultimately like, you know, we do have some millennials that might actually listen to this. I don't know if I'm in their, in their demographic to listen to, but sure. it's, it's for disc jockey. Right. And I'm like, but you're not really using discs as much now. Cause do you use digital now? Or do you still like, like, like the feel of records or do you do both it's- or. It's digital manipulated. I still use records because okay. the it's complicated. I don't even truly understand it, but basically it's there's time code on the record. So okay. when I move it a certain way, it instantly kind of knows. And so I'm still using records. Okay. You know, like cool. that's, ex- I, I try to use control. They have controllers, you know, that kind of, there's discs that kind of emulate uh, a turntable and a record. It just doesn't feel quite right to me. So I still, you know, records are still my choice. You know, I still deal with 
the problems of needles and dust buildup and stuff during a show. I have to like, you know, clean the needle off in the middle, you know, I'm on stage. Um, but I, you know, just that it's, it's just, I can't get away from it. That is so cool though. I think that is yeah. really cool. Cause it's like, got this like truly, Oh, I don't want to, I don't know how to say pure feel to it. Right. Like I oh, just, totally. when I think about a DJ, that's what I see. Like I close my eyes and it's like, you're on stage with a table and there's like turntables yeah, yeah. and then your, you know, your MC comes out and they kind of yep. run around, but you're kind of at the center of it, you know? Yeah. And now like you see bands or whatever, the DJ's like off the side of the stage or not even on the stage yeah. <laughs> per se. Yeah, but, sometimes. But, yeah. Right. But and that's OK, because sometimes it is about the band and the musicians mm -hmm. and like you can have that mixture. But I think people also don't realize that there's still often like a DJ or something, even with live bands. Isn't that true? Yeah, a lot. I mean, uh, not as much as maybe like in, in, the, in the 2000s. There was a lot. I mean, I mean, like, with you know, obviously Linkin Park kind of blew up that whole thing. So it was like ev all of a sudden everybody wants to have a DJ and it's like, well, you know, Lincoln Park is the best example of that, I think. Okay. And a lot, there was a lot of like other bands that, you know, hey, not my thing, but I definitely a Lincoln Park fan. Um, and I think that was an, an amazing time. Actually, I, now, that, now that you mentioned that, I think that was when, uh, the DJ as as a musician was pretty. I think that's kind of solidified it. Okay, you know so then I mean? they because, kind of gave him a little bit of respect when there was that. Oh, totally, because that because they brought it back to in in a in a huge you know stadium rock sense. Like, oh yeah, hey, here's this instrument. This is gonna lead the song, and you get. I was just like, oh, this is all right. This is the next level right here. <laughs> Yeah. So but of course, you get, the, you get the copycat bands and it's like, oh, okay, guys, let's let's chill. Let's just let these guys do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, you know, you can't blame them, right? For sure. for, yeah. for wanting to like, you know, kind of like. Um, oh, totally. To, totally. to kind of be that next thing. Right. So. Yeah. All right. So. So I do want to ask you about the whole record thing, because mm -hmm. I don't even know, like they still make records or they still, is there like a market because you guys are keeping it alive? Or you know, I remember watching documentaries and I think it was like the beat nuts or something. And they were like, uh -huh. yeah, you know, we're going through the stores, these old record stores. Yeah, and yeah. we're just looking for that gold, you know, that diamond in the rough. <laughs> and they found this like nursery rhyme, um, you know, and it's that, oh, yeah. that beat nuts, that beat. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, oh yeah, we found, they sampled it and it, it's just, it works. But like, I think that takes a certain type of ear, right? Like I mm -hmm. would never go, hey, I got these old records of my mom's in my garage. Like literally right now I have old records in my <laughs> garage and I'm like, I don't think any DJ or anybody would want any of this. But then I think back to that doc and I'm like, yeah. well, but you never know. It could just yeah. be, you know, two bars or like 10, you know, it could just be a small sample. Like you could, that goes a long way, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. So how does that search, like how did that search for you happen when you first started? Were you in the record stores like that? And then how does it, how do you search now? Uh, yeah, I mean, back then it was only record stores. Like if, if the crazy thing is like, Oh man, that was a rough time because back then, if you weren't at the record store when a certain song came out, you just didn't have it because how are you going to play it? You, there were no CD players in the, in the clubs or anything like you had to have the actual physical record. So a lot of my friends who worked at the radio station had all the hits first. You know what I mean? I was like, Oh God, you guys like, let me just borrow. Let me, I would borrow. Like, I remember, um, it was a TLC song, not No Scrubs, but it was, uh, before I that, it was. yeah, a little before No Scrub, but it, it was nobody, like, nobody had it except for like two people, uh, on the station. And it was, we were all just like kind of rotating it. Like, I would go borrow it for my gig and then go bring it to him at his gig, and then he would play. It was just like, this is for one record. Like, <laughs> this is insane. What are we doing here? Uh, now I it's totally it. different. You can get oh, yeah. it in like five seconds. Right, right. That's what I was going to say. It's like you could just type it in and then here's your song. And you Yeah, know. but then you don't value it as much. 
that's, I that's was the one thing. Ask you that because isn't there something about the search and the find, right? Totally. Like there are records that I that have not left my crate for twenty years because I I just there's just something about you know it's just like a like a like a like comfort food like a warm blanket like you know I mean I, I don't bring like crates of records around anymore but like <laughs> when I first started touring you know I would have a crate of records and. There were some songs that I didn't necessarily play every night, but just to see them there was like, oh, okay, cool. Like I just, it's just kind of like a, a little bit of like home. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. I understand. It's kind of crazy. And just the experience of going to a record store and just talking to other DJs about our experiences. You know, I mean, yes, you have message boards now and whatever, and you know, chat groups and stuff. It's not quite the same. You know what I mean? Because people are are a little, they're, you know, they're a little nicer when you're in person. Yeah, this is this is this crosses <laughs> over with other podcasts I've had about this whole mm-hmm. social media digital age, like that disconnect between human contact, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think, like you said, it's much cooler if you are in the same bin as another DJ and you're like kind of both searching for that thing, yeah. and you're like, oh, what are you working on? And that that type yeah. of conversation that gets struck is like a real one versus online. You can kind of be whoever the hell you want. And in your own mind, you th- there becomes these delusions of grandeur of who you are also. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and oh, yeah. so I just feel like those personas are so, you know, superficial. So it's super superficial. And I, I just miss that. I miss be, like, on you know, you'd go to a record store on a Friday and it's just packed because everyone's stocking up for their gigs. And like, yeah, you kind of fight over some records too, because you know there's a limited amount. But, right. You know, for the most part, everyone's kind of like, you know, we're just kind of sharing our little, our little war stories or whatever, and you know, talking about what what uh, what mixes kind of what what mix you did that that really worked or right. what you know you, you complain about this client or whatever, and <laughs> it's just kind of cool. Like that's empathy, uh, empathy, <laughs> totally. And you need that because we're all struggling. We're all, you know, it's we're all trying to get the same gigs and stuff. And I, I do miss that. I miss that. Like just that, that was our water cooler. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just kind of a place that we can just kind of be th- just DJs together. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, you said war stories. Is there like a fun kind of early on war story or like disaster? Huh. Or like something you can think <laughs> of that's kind of, you know, that you and your fellow DJs would laugh about because they would get it. Like you said, oh, the needle and, you know, all these other things. I just I find that really fascinating, actually. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, to this day, it's all about just the ridiculous requests and the things that people request. Like, I don't deal with that. And I haven't done like clubs like that in maybe 10, 15 years. But I remember the very fresh memories, you know, of drunk people just coming over and just you know it's it's just there's no other job like and i can't you know you would never go to i mean not like we're brain surgeons but you would never go to your doctor and be like well do this play this (laughs) you know take this out instead i think you're doing it wrong you know (laughs) What? <laughs> you need to just have a sign at your DJ table like no requests, no opinions, no yeah, suggestions. Yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> they all have that. Every booth has that. Really? Even if they try to do it in little clever ways and stuff. Like I saw one that was like uh anytime anytime someone requests and it was like some pop scene whatever. Uh so and so anytime someone requests Britney Spears. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz we're this Cuz I've Britney Spears is my go-to pop, pop person yeah. because I'm that age. It was just and, too much at one point, yeah. too. It was like, oh, really? Yeah. Still with... The- okay, Complete go on. Complete overload. <laughs> so it was a sign that said, like, anytime someone requests a Britney Spears song, you know, uh, the orphan dies or something like that. So it's just like, that doesn't stop anybody. Well, that's the problem. You can't be clever with a drunk audience. Exactly. It's completely <laughs> lost on them. That's just for us. Yes. But no, have you had someone like fall into your stuff, mess up equipment or do anything where it's like really like a disaster or places where you're like, I'm just, I'm sorry. Or was there a point where like, I'm not doing these type of gigs anymore. I need to move on. Like, was yeah, there a turning I th- point? I think that was it. Like just having, cause I don't deal with that because to me it's, it, 
I'm so like, it's a, it's a craft and I got to, you know, scratch and there's the needle here. Don't touch the needle. That I was just like, yo, this, there's gotta be a better way. Like I need to, you know, I just kind of put my foot down and said, I, I'm going to go this direction instead. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so what was that direction? So where, where did you go with it? And I know like now you're, I know you tour still with like far side. Mm-hmm. And so what was like your big break or that moment where you're like, okay, I can run with this. This is the balls rolling for me in the right way now. I think it was when I, w- when I, when I started incorporating video into my set, um, because there was just the technology kind of just went there for some strange reason uh video manipulation kind of happened in djing and the first time i saw it i was in japan and i i had met the uh a rep from pioneer because they were making cd turntables and i was like i i can't use these they're just weird to me and they're like well what are you interested in i'm like well you know I love videos. Like I'm starting to, what, what I was doing at the time was I would, I would do my turntable set. It was about an hour and I would play basically just visuals that I could just run that didn't really have anything to do with anything specific, but I just wanted something up. Do you know what I mean? Like it, I, w- I literally just pressed play and then just did my set. There was no like timing to it. Mm-hmm. So they said, oh, let's show you this other thing then. And so they brought me to this other room where it was this uh, a digital turntable that looked like a CDJ, a little bigger, but it was called the DVJ. And you could put DVDs in there and scratch DVDs. And I was like, oh, my God, what is this? This is science fiction right here. So <laughs> I remember they had a um, they had a Beyonce video in it just kind of queued up and playing. And I was just like. I was scratching that. I was like, oh my, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm manipulating a video like this. Wow. And, but the sound insane. was still playing. But sound was, was playing. Sound was scratching too. Okay. Wow. That is the cool. whole thing. I was like, I just, I've never, you know, up until that point, it was only something that you sort of like kind of talk about with your DJ friends. Like, right. oh, one day we'll scratch record. We'll scratch videos. So I mean, what, we'll like around what year was then. that? <laughs> This was like 2000, I want to say 2004. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Technology. Seems like just yesterday. But, I know. I know. Um, when you say 2004, I'm like, oh, that wasn't that long ago. Okay. I guess it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was <laughs> coming up on oof, yeah. <laughs> 15 years from there. But then, I mean, so then I was doing, I was doing that for a little while and that, um, so they let me take that home and I kind of knew exactly what I wanted to do with it because I had already been doing these visual things. Uh, so I kind of built a little set based on that technology. Um, it was about a half an hour set, just kind of like, you know, doing my little things. And, you know, I'll, I would build and build a build. Um, and then I, I would tour with that. And that was a whole other thing because then I had to set up the screens and everything, mm. you know, in addition to setting up the turntables and and doing like, you know, full sound checks and everything like that. And which is also a a whole other, you know, battle because a lot of the venues just didn't have, you know, visual thing. It's not like every venue had screens like they do now. So I had to travel with my own uh, projector and, you know, big screen and everything. And uh, which was not, it, it was challenging, but like, super rewarding you know mm-hmm. what i mean like you spend like two hours to set it up but like wow this is a cool show yeah and there's something definitely to that because of course now you see like a lot of visuals and stuff and, and everything and yeah. no offense to the dj obviously but it is kind of cool to see other things other than just the dj up there oh sure right? yeah. you know because after yeah. a while like you know and so i can imagine and what i've really loved of course if people go to your website, they could see this and your YouTube channel, they could see this mm-hmm. evolution of it. I think you should put up like some of your really old stuff. That's like, Oh God. No. Yeah. Yes, you should. <laughs> because, because what you do now, it is all very intricately timed. Every, mm-hmm. every beat you have is specific to like a pin drop or a wrist flick yeah. or, and I'm, I'm really into music and performance um, with my Kung Fu. I do a lot mm-hmm. of artistic things. So I am like listening to music 
And you said it on your um, teaser that you listen to music differently. And I feel like I also do the same, not probably at near the level you need to, because you're like, you know, overlaying things and listen to me. But I listen to music for those accents and those things where I can make something visual happen uh. while on stage with my performers. You know, like if there's a blackout moment or if there's, you know, something really small, someone like turns and looks right on that cue. And people don't know in the audience like, oh, that was time to music because it's on the it's in the background. It's not just on the big, yeah, yeah. you know, cymbal clash or drum beat. You know, it's like on the very small accents that I like things to happen. And I notice that you do a lot of that in your video mixes and your music. Um, you do these really cool mashups with uh, film now where you take like mm -hmm. you do homages to like Star Wars and yeah, um, yeah. Back to the Future and Baby Driver must have been like a thrill mm -hmm. for you to see that film oh, yeah. actually. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I see like your the way that you incorporated it. It's really timed and I'd like you to kind of talk a little bit about that inspiration and and how you also say you listen to music differently mm -hmm. uh i mean i think that all comes from i mean the whole listening to music differently is like you said like like that's just a hip-hop thing like i'm sure you know the beat nuts and premiere and everybody just kind of listens to some i mean we yeah we all listen to songs listening for certain elements I mean, everyone, you know, everyone's taste is different. So, you know, I'm looking for like, I want an open drum, which means a drum sample that doesn't have anything on top of it that I can just sample like a clean kick like a doom, doom, or a snare like a kah, kah, uh, just by itself with no like extra bass line or, or, a, or a trumpet on top or guitar or whatever. Um, or, you know, you look for a, a phrase or something like that. So in, you know, in, in our minds, we're, it's kind of separated. Do you know what I mean? The, the, the elements are separate. You can already see the tracks laid out, you know, as individual parts. So you're looking for that. And so when I'm watching, you know, now that I'm working with visuals, I'm watching things in that same way. So it's kind of like, it didn't really take much uh, adjustment to do that. You know, I'm already watching movies. And, and if I hear like, Oh, I can make something out of that. That that was pretty rhythmic. Or I I'm gonna force that into a rhythm because I just like the phrase and I like the way it was said. And yeah, it's just it it's kind of it's hard to explain because it's so like just how I've been doing it for so long. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it's yeah, that's kind of like how that's that's how things kind of uh uh. That's how I absorb things. That's how things kind of like enter my brain. Yes. Yeah. And I know it's, it's hard to explain. And this is why I want my listeners to go right now to Realm Vision and <laughs> Mike Realm's website, because when you see it, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I have, I have a couple of things that kind of bounced around there. It's like, one, does it make you listen to music and watch film? Like I've talked to a lot of film critics. I've talked to a lot of people who are in the film mm -hmm. industry and, and a few people in the music. Like, can you not enjoy things for like, just like take yourself away from it or are you listening all the time and like almost working, right? You're like hearing things oh, and being yeah, inspired. Yeah. Is it hard for you to disconnect and just to go, I'm just going to watch this film and that's it. Or I'm just going to hear this song and that's it. Or is, is it, are you always turning in your head? Uh, I kind of always am turning, but when I'm watching a film that's like current in the theaters, it's a lot easier because I know I can't just like get that sample. So I can watch it and be like, well, even if there's this, this amazing section, I got to wait, you know, three months for it anyways. So let's just, let's just enjoy this. Okay. You know? And sometimes, you know, a lot of times like something is just so good, you get lost in it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like, oh, I totally forgot to like look for things, you know, which Those is are nice. Cool moments. Yeah, Those, that's, that's really gotta be. Nice. And and unfortunately, I mean, my husband and I were just talking about this. It's like we always end up kind of rewatching some of the old films, but I never rewatch mm -hmm. newer films, like say the last five years or something. You know, oh. I, I love the superhero films. I'm not gonna lie, but yeah, yeah. I don't need to rewatch a lot of them. And there's huh. something to be said for that because maybe I'm not listening for sound, but I think there's something to be said for that in terms of like the depth of the film like they're always yes. visually really cool 
And yeah, they're funny and the script moves you along. But there's something mm-hmm. to be said about to me for of the depth of a lot of what's being turned out now compared to the depth of like I could watch some of my old school films and music, listen to that over and over and over. Like uh, maybe it's just an age thing. <laughs> I think it is an age thing. I've heard I've heard it's an age thing. Um, and I, I've heard something, I mean, I don't know, th- this might be just like some stupid, you know, clickbait stuff that I'm looking at, but they say, I've heard that, you know, you sort of just love what you love at a certain age, maybe, you know, early twenties, mid twenties, when you kind of start finding yourself, um, that could be totally wrong, but it seems to be consistent across the board with people that, I mean, that I've ever talked to about taste in anything yeah I mean know. I agree with you because it depends what's happening in your life and what that song means to you or what that mm-hmm. fil- how that film spoke to you and I'm not saying there aren't films now that in 10 years I'll go oh that was a great film I yeah, just say yeah, they're yeah. far and fewer in between because I yeah. can also listen to like 60s music and have this immense appreciation in the yeah, way that's that weird. me too Why in the that? way that now because as time has evolved, I feel like uh, market and audience and whatnot don't demand as much from our artists and our songwriters. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, like I love the fact that Eminem just came out with his album and totally mm-hmm. like destroyed a lot of the stuff that I feel has no substance. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. maybe it is an age thing, but if you actually just looked at it as literature and like read this song compared to this mumble rap song, like. Right. You can't tell me there's no substance here and there is, you know, like it's to yeah, me, like yeah. you could just have an art, an English teacher read that and go, yeah, this is pretty amazing and it makes sense yeah. and there's like substance. So I feel like there's a bit of that, you know, so I had totally. one more question about the technical stuff and then I want to okay. talk some more about. So now the way the sound can come together, like you could, like you said, you could get a song in 30 seconds, less than that. You could almost, I'm sure with all the technology, like you could separate things easier. Like before mm-hmm. we had cassettes and records and whatever, like there was no way to separate things. Like even right before we started speaking, you're like, oh, how are you recording? I'm like, oh, don't worry. I have two tracks, two audio tracks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that way I can separate you out in case I cough during your thing and that's going to be gone. Yeah. But like. Does that actually make it easy? I know on some way it's like this amazing gift to sound engineers and DJs and and Mm -hmm. stuff because it makes it so easy. But I wonder if it actually makes it more challenging because then you have the rabbit hole effect where you could just go on and on and on and on forever because there's so many options now. Yes. What is that like for you? Uh, I, I mean, I, maybe again, it's, it's, it's uh, the school I grew up in, but I sort of prefer, I mean, okay, with with music, it's different because when when it's a film, like when I work with a studio and, and they're like, okay, what assets do you need? I say, give me everything with no music. Just get, I just want it clean because that gets that's uh, it, it, sonically it's just different from trying to extract a sound from a song. From a song, I kind of like when it has extra stuff on it. Like if you listen to like. Jay Dilla production, you can hear what he was trying to filter out, or you can hear just a little bit of the next, you know, like uh, the loop isn't quite what you would consider technically perfect, Mm -hmm. but it's perfect in that it has a swing to it. And there's a little, maybe a little bit of like a, a vocal that was clipped out at the end, but that, that helps. That's a part of the the swing. Okay. And I think if, you know, if he had, you know, uh, access to the stems of that track, it, w- it would be just too clean. And I think you can tell the difference. And a, a lot of, um, you know, you know uh, people who try to emulate that, they'll do it too clean. Mm. And it's like, ah. Does it yeah, have the I character? Yeah, the character, or it just feels too sterile. It's sterile. I see what you mean. Okay. You know okay. what I mean? I yeah. like it when it's dirty. Like, oh, I know they kept the crackle of the record in. Like, that's <laughs> that's that particular record. Like, no other record will give you that exact sound. This is what I mean about Some you being a bit of a that. purist. <laughs> totally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one else cares about this stuff. And, I, I, mean, I actually do. I think it's, and I'm not a DJ by any means, but I, I just, I really love 
maybe it's my kung fu side. Like I like going down into the root of things. I'm real traditionalist mm-hmm. when it comes yep. to stuff and whatever. I can appreciate all the fancy crazy things and whatever that's out there but at the same yeah. time i'm like oh man but there's something about like that hard work and that like length of time it takes to develop something mm-hmm. right and i think that is kind of the same for you in your music where it's like well no this artist or production or producer mm-hmm. took so much time to put all this together why would i rip it apart <laughs> yeah exactly and also i think in terms of like like what you're saying like just putting the time in and building the foundation you can do anything with that. Like you can't go the opposite way. You can't take a bunch of shortcuts and then expect to be able to do what the tried and true masters of the craft are doing. Cause it's just going to sound generic. Like you can, you can kind of, uh, uh, I guess approximate it. Okay. You know, I think somebody, there's a lot of you know life hackers like, Oh, I could learn this in 30 days with, took this person 20 years like yeah i guess you could sort of like make it look like you could do it to the average person but mm-hmm. you get your ass kicked you know, <laughs> in, you know in real life um and dj is the same way like it's i mean there are so many people that love music which is great they'll pick up a turntable or a controller or whatever which is great or they'll pick up whatever an app on their phone I love that. I love that it's everybody has access to it um, because now everyone knows how hard it is. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, oh yeah, I know, I know, I know, because I have to do the edits for when we do like a show production, and I actually have to like lay the tracks, and it's not even anything where I'm mixing. But yeah, it's yeah. just even like, oh, I need to take out a minute and a half of the song because we don't mm-hmm. need to perform for five minutes, just three, or, or you know. And I'm like, yeah. oh, which part do I take out? I'm sitting here like counting. You sh- you, if you watch yeah. me, you would laugh because it is so <laughs> like basic. But I was like, yeah, a normal person couldn't hear this cut, but like you would probably cringe and it'd be like that record scratch, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, like, ugh. I mean, Ugh. some DJs do it too. Like it's just, it's all, it's so subjective. Yeah. Yeah. It's music. It's art. Right. So, all right. So who, I mean, I'd like you to talk a little bit about who you've worked with and who's been some of your favorites to work with. Like I said, Mm -hmm. I know right now you're currently still with Farside and Mm -hmm. still get to go on tour and stuff. Like maybe you could share some of, some of that world. Yeah. I've, I've been so fortunate, like my entire life, my entire career for this. I mean, to me, it just kind of felt normal that I was around these people, but I guess to other people, other DJs, it's just like, wait, what? Like, so I grew up in Daly City, which is a suburb of San Francisco. A lot of uh, a lot of Asian people there, like, we're known just to have. I think I think it's one of the highest concentration of Filipino people. Uh, in the country, possibly. Oh wow! I don't so have lot stats of, on of, that. A lot of break dancers. A lot of break dancers, <laughs> whole lot. Uh, a lot of karaoke, <laughs> a lot of nurses. Um, so I grew up in that. And I guess the analogy would be like, you know, in, in Southern California, there were garage bands. Mm-hmm. But we had DJs. Like people would have, you know, huge stacks of speakers in their garage, in the parents' garage, just like kind of having a party with just a bunch of DJs trying to mix records and whatever. Um, DJ groups were like 20 deep for no reason. There was only like one guy who could actually mix records, but 20 people were just kind of there to, to, you know, just to be at the party. It's the hype, hype men. Totally hype men. But they would just sit there with their jackets. <laughs> Those are the older kids. I want, and I want oh, a man. DJ jacket. That's all I'm saying. That's why, you know, like, yeah. and, and I was, I remember I was, I was a freshman in high school and I was like, who are these cool guys walking around with their, ja- they're not, they look like, they were like Leatherman jackets, right? But okay. they weren't athletes. Right. It looked cooler. I was like, oh, these are designed. They're not like the, the block letter, right, you know, varsity, right. whatever. It's just like, shit. Like, I, it just looked cool. And, it, you know, um, and then I realized, oh, okay, those are the DJs. The, like, and then I'm thinking, Wow, all of them? <laughs> <laughs> How do you take turns? But so I grew up in that. So I was around a lot of, I, you know, even when, when I first started, I, I had friends who kind of had older brothers who were into it. And I, I would um, like my brother, my brother's like a year and a half younger than me. So we kind of started doing this. We're basically the same age. Uh, so he had friends who had uh, 
older it's always older siblings who have stuff and they'll pass on like the vhs tapes and it's like oh these are uh this this is the scratch pickles like you know mix master mike um <laughs> like it's old tape like eight generations down and it's like oh man this guy's really good uh and uh so of course mix master mike lived in the bay area yeah uh, so we meet him and meet you know shortcut and cubert and d styles and everybody and nice those guys were the they were the the best scratchers in the world and so we were just kind of around that and and to just kind of take in that influence and you know i, I was the generation before not before uh behind so we were you know my generation was like the 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 younger brother groups you know of uh, of those guys so I, that, just to have that around was like, it is a blessing. Right. So, and that kind of kept us going because it's like, okay, there's a path. Do you know what I mean? Like there's an example of what you can do. You don't have to do clubs or whatever, you know, any, all this other, you can be just your own performer. Mm-hmm. Like, whoa, that's kind of nice. Yeah, th- th- it is pretty convenient that you were there where Mixed Master Mike was. I mean, totally. it's, not, it's not like you were like, you know, somewhere in like Ohio, like, I really want to be a hip hop DJ. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. do I do this? That was, that's, you know? that's pretty convenient. So, yes, yeah, so a little bit pretty of an convenient. outlier there because you're in the right place, but it still takes a lot of hard work and still like persistence. Like you can't yeah. just be around it and like it falls in your lap. So what exactly. next? Exactly. Because it wasn't like they were throwing us gigs or like right. sitting us down like, okay, youngin. Yeah. Here's what you got it Pass, was just nothing on like my that. turntable to oh you. yeah there was Here's no. my needle <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but they, you know they were there for you know what like, but inspiration, like, inspiration and, and, and close influence. up yeah definitely yeah yeah and then so um i think later on uh my world kind of expanded uh who was like the next sort of i guess like uh, money mark do you know money mark money mark no, I don't think so. He is one of the most amazing musicians on the planet. Uh, he played with the Beastie Boys. Oh, okay. Uh, his own stuff is just like got like you'll. I'll send you stuff. You'll okay, melt. for sure. Um, went on tour with him, and he was a great mentor because he was the first. He was kind of the first uh, person that I had toured with. I toured before, but he was the first one that I really kind of got to see uh, lead a band. Okay. You know, sort of put in the work and, and, and uh, I got to watch him just sort of like, like he wasn't like, you know, super strict. I'm like, oh, you missed this. But he was very like, Hey man, that was cool. It's like, he's a true musician, like such a great musician. Like he just kind of, he knows when to go with it. He knows when to, you know, sort of like, I don't know. It's it's one of those things that, I, yeah, super lucky. Um, and then it was like Gift of Gab from Black Alicious that went on tour with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was my first nationwide tour. And that, again, one of the most amazing lyricists on the planet. Um, getting to watch him work. He was the first person that I saw uh, literally in the middle of the show, just stand there on stage and just get like the biggest ovation. Just stand there with this mic, just looking at the crowd. I thought that was the most amazing thing ever. Uh, but you have to earn that. You yep. know what I mean? Like, yeah, of course. So it taught me that like you can have, you can craft these moments in your show, you know? And I, you know, I, I, I knew about like, you know, the encore before, you know, like that, all that stuff is fine. Or, or like, you know, you, 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 you do your, your best song and then everyone cheers. Right. But like, that was like, that was like in the middle of the show. You just stop. Like creating a moment, owning a moment. Yeah. yeah. And just without words, just yeah. like have that. Um, after that, I toured with Mike Patton mm-hmm. um, and he's another just pure music, just a, just, Similar to Money Mark in in the in the aspect of he knows what he wants mm-hmm. and he knows how to get it, um, but uh, yeah, just another musical genius that just I was very fortunate to just be on that tour and a lot of fun to be around. Um, he put a great band together and it was just one of those uh, 
one of the funnest times I've had on tour because we did we did the states for a little while. We did Europe, um, mm-hmm. and he I watched him work, and a lot of people. He's one of those guys that just is revered um kind of on it's on a lot of levels he's just i mean just it, musical talent just artistic talent uh but he works hard and i saw that and i'm like oh okay even though he's at this level here it the work doesn't stop right I mean, he's right. still we're on tour but he's working on the next album or he has this other idea that's go he's doing a, a, a record in all italian or something i'm like dude what like <laughs> Where does where's this all coming from? And it's like, that's what has to fuel you is like all this other stuff. You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't stop. Like what you see, I, that's what the one thing I learned I think from that tour is like what you what you're currently seeing as an audience member can't be it. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like we're we're on tour, we're doing these shows, but that's not it. There's like five other things that's gonna happen, and those things did happen. Those, he did do these things, you know, within the next few years. And I'm like, damn. Okay. So there's just all the wheels are constantly turning. Right. Like right. they kind of have to be, but when it comes time to do the show, you're in the moment, you got to snap, right. You're here. You know what I mean? You're in this room and you're, it's just like a, I, yeah, I just was able to see how all that stuff works. And that was, that was incredibly helpful. For my next tour, which was with Del the Funky Homo Sapien, opening for him, um, that was a long, that was like about a year that we were out. Um, And that was, that was the first tour that I did where I was the opening act and I did my whole visual thing. Ah, okay. Yeah, that was the one where I had, you know, I, I brought some friends with me and we set up the screens and do all this. It was like a 10 foot screen on stage every day. We had to figure out like, where do we hang the projector? Like, this is all we, like, we were basically rigging a show, you know, every day where you probably didn't, shouldn't have been doing that. Um, <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> totally worked. Totally worth it. Because I just felt like that was such a new thing for everybody, including mm-hmm. me, that it was just, you know, and the technology had gotten so much crazier. Like then um, it went from now I can manipulate the visuals with records with Serato because they created a video plugin because uh, Serato uh, Serato DJ is the uh, is that is the program that everyone uses for okay. DJing you know you put all your songs in there and then it basically emulates turntables and the latency is super low so you don't even really feel the it doesn't feel like you're doing anything different than turntables whatever um, so they have a video plugin now and I'm like oh my god now I can manipulate the visuals with records on both sides and do all the stuff with the mixer and everything. And I was like, dude, this it's on now, you know? <laughs> so that tour was, the, I, yeah, another just incredible experience. Del Funky Homo Sapien, obviously what, you know, one of my favorites. Yeah, um, yeah. So touring with him and watching how he approaches things. Everyone has a different approach and it's right. like, wow, this is amazing that they're all, they, these guys are all at the top of their craft and they're able to, they're the way they, they're, I, I just love being around such a wide range of artists because I get to see their approach and see, you know, okay, how does he deal with this? Or how does he, you know, uh, get this out of the audience mm-hmm. or what is he doing when we're not on stage? Cause 99% of the time you're not performing. Mm-hmm. You're just on a bus. You know what I mean? Like what, what, what are they reading? What are they listening? What is everybody listening to? What are we watching? What are, are we going to watch a movie on the bus? What are we, you know, what are, what, what are we going to eat? Food is a big thing. On Food tour. is a big thing. Always. Yes. <laughs> For me. Always. Anyway. <laughs> no, no. I, I think the touring thing is like awesome. And I love that, you know, as this has progressed, it went from just like an audio thing to an audio visual thing. Mm-hmm. And then like, I know you went to film school, correct? Yep. I went to okay. film school. And this is before before all th- that all that yeah okay so in the back of my mind i'm like okay i'll dj for a little while and i'll get into filmmaking and then it'll be fine i'll be 25 and it's it's all good <laughs> but- <laughs> 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 
didn't have quite happen that way. Right. But <laughs> I, th- I think that, the, the, I mean, obviously the, the film influence came into play in, in an unexpected way with all with in, in DJing, which is kind of dumb luck for me. Right. Like this, it could have been like, why was what I still to this day have no idea why DJing and turntablism has become like this great uh, vehicle for manipulating visuals. It's yeah. so, it's just like, why? Why did this happen? Yeah, I'm so I, glad it did. It did. It really did. And I do want you to share your Iron Man 2 trailer story because, you know, our audience will probably not go and click on every link on your thing, but I think it's a really ah, right, cool right, story right. that you can share because this like kind of shows like the meld of both worlds and how, like it is a thing, you know, it's yeah, not just totally. a hobby. It's totally a thing. <laughs> yeah. So I think after, well, after the Dell tour, I got a a cold call from Blue Man Group because they were going on tour. Okay. Yeah. And so they were like, oh yeah, we saw some clips, uh, you know, on YouTube because I would, I was uploading, this is early days of YouTube. Mm-hmm. So I was uploading clips uh, of my show to YouTube because it was so hard to describe you know, especially back then, this was like what you do, right? Yeah, it was like 2006. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, I, I, I'm a turntablist, but I, but I'm scratching the videos, and so people are like, what? This is <laughs> okay. Who's doing the videos? Like, no, it's me. Oh, all right. Just it, <laughs> it's just too much. Like already, there's no elevator pitch for it. It's just, it's too, it takes too long. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would just upload videos to YouTube show you know, at my shows so you can hear the crowd because the crowd it was getting a good, a good reaction. Um, and so Blue Man Group comes calling because they're going on tour and they want to bring something, you know, because it's Blue Man Group. They want yes, something very visual, you know, and yeah, visual, musical, different. something <laughs> different. Yeah, something interesting. Um, and so I got to go on that tour for uh how long was that? Like maybe almost two years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Touring the country and uh, talk about influence. Like that's just a ridiculous every night I was noticing different things about the show. Like, I mean, there's just so much going on. Like mm-hmm. if you see, you, you can't just watch them once you have to go multiple times to even kind of absorb half of what's going on. Uh, just in terms of like, and that was, you know, a huge jump from doing, you know, clubs that were, you know, maybe a thousand, two thousand people to like all 20,000 people stadiums. And so for me, it was a big learning experience because we were playing to people that I would not have reached otherwise. You know, these right. were not hip hop fans. Not hip hop. Yeah. Way not hip hop fans. Right. <laughs> um, but the funny thing is they got it like, right. quicker than I think quicker than than hip hop fans did. Because they had a clean slate when it came to DJing. Right. So they just thought, oh, this is what DJs do. All right. That's- yeah. And they were there for this audiovisual exactly. kind of eclectic experience. So there wasn't an expectation because it's kind of like with Blue Man, it's like all these different things. Yeah. You know, of so- course. Of course the DJ is going to do something weird. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> of course it's going to be something futuristic. Yeah. Uh, so then, yeah. So then that got me into uh youtube okay it was just like all right that that's a that's a platform right, okay right. i'll just so i'll just put everything on here because before that it was about quicktime videos and not everyone had the quicktime plugin right to your website and look at the <laughs> thing and uh, yes there yes was flash and all this yes stuff. yes and yes thank goodness so like, <laughs> you've got a forum now youtube everyone can yes. log in they can see your work they see yeah. all your visuals and it plays is it's that when fine. you started doing these trailers that's when I started doing the trailers because okay. I was like, well, there, you know, w- with the live stuff, that's one thing that that can be done with all this like music and video stuff. Mm-hmm. But then I was like, you know, there's other things because I knew how to like edit video. Um, so I started I did uh, what I would do is I would download the uh, the trailers from Apple trailers because they would just have it for mm-hmm. free. You could just download it, whatever. Um, and then I would take those. And, and the first one I did. Actually, the first one I did um, was a, I think it was a, it wasn't Iron Man, but it was, it was a Lionsgate movie. I think it was The Transporter or something. Okay. Yeah. And they, they actually approached me to do that. Oh, and okay. 
that did really well. Is that just because they saw your YouTube channel? They saw me, I think they saw me live or, or something. live. Okay. okay. Yeah. I forgot what it was, but somebody there had the idea of like, Hey, let's just give him stuff and we'll just let him go to town. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I have no, I have no idea what this was going to be, but I just started sort of messing around with it and, and started kind of building these rhythms. And I was like, Oh, wait a second. I see what's going on. Okay. I could do this. So, uh, I started doing more stuff on my own and then Iron Man was another one because that, that was coming up and I was like, well, let me try, let me try uh, doing one with like, w- w- with, I don't even know where I'm going with that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So, so then you, then you decided you were going to do something with the Iron Man 2 trailer. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, because it was like, that was the big movie coming out. Right. So let me, let me let me try to catch let me try to time this so that it catches like uh, the wave of like viewers on because everyone's searching for certain You're things. Looking yeah, for friend, Iron Man, right? Exactly. And a friend of mine was like, you know, you should try. Yeah, you should try to like do stuff that's uh, uh, timely like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what. Yeah, I did it. Didn't think anything. So I was like, well, it's still YouTube. It's still a very a very new platform. And not everyone's on it. Whatever. So I I made one. I did a little uh, uh, thing at the end where I'm talking and I, I, at like two in the morning, I went to go buy an Iron Man mask from Walmart. So I was like, let me just, let me just get into it. I'll, I'll, I'll make this a little thing. So I wear the Iron Man mask and, and then I, I do a little vlog at the end. And uh, if I knew that John Favreau was actually going to see it, I would not have worn the mask uh, because. <laughs> but that might have uh, added to the character. That might have added to the whole bit. P- possibly, but it's just like, oh my you god, you were so people, committed, super committed. But I didn't realize people were going to actually see it. I thought it would just be like a fun thing for my friends. You know what I mean? Like, oh look at that. But uh, then, yeah, it got out, and he tweeted it, and then and then um, and then he hit me up and was like, hey. I kind of like this. Can we turn it into a commercial? And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like what? Okay. Uh, so th- yeah, that was, that was that. And then that was, became something that I just kind of did. Cause I, it was, it fed another side of my brain. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like it's totally the, the opposite of a live show because I have, you know, I have weeks to craft something mm-hmm. versus, I'm going to go up for an hour and like do this, you know, and then it's gone. You know, I think that for me, like I really wanted to, you know, I, I love doing live shows. There's really nothing like it. Um, but then you do a live show and it's, that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, you go home. Uh, and even if somebody's filming, it's not, it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. You know live I mean? shows are meant to be seen live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whereas these video edits, are meant to be like played and shared and yeah, those are meant yeah. to be kind of taken with you. And I, I feel like I, that was one thing that I just, that's important to me is to have something that it can, you know, live past, you know, l- last night, you know what I mean? Like it, it just kind of goes on. You can go look at it whenever you want. Um, it can go further than I can by myself, you know, in, in, two days or whatever, however long it takes for a video to cycle through the, the ether. Um, you know what I mean? And so, and, and also those are a lot of fun. Like mm-hmm. I love just kind of taking, you know, finding things. That's another, uh, I mean, again, back to sampling that just to be able to go and like find things that no one was looking for. And, you know, even the people who, who might've been the filmmakers were could be like, why well, I, I, yeah, I didn't realize you could do that with that. Right. You know, I yeah, love that, doing that. That's what John Favreau saw was like, oh, okay. That's a different take on my Iron Man or what I was envisioning. And I think he kind of appreciated that, which is so cool. Very, very yeah. cool. I, very cool. I, I, like last couple of questions. I have to ask because, you know, you are Chinese. And so were your mm-hmm. parents excited about this DJ lifestyle um, choice like this? Oh, this is my career because, I mean, let's face it. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm Chinese, so I know, like, you know, there's like, you're going to college. It'd be awesome yeah. if you'd be a doctor, lawyer, engineer type, you know, like there's yeah, these stereotypes yeah. that we all live through. I mean, how, how did they feel about this, uh, artist in you? 
Oh, they loved it. They said, you know what? You should quit school and just do this. <laughs> Seriously. Like we see these turntables in the house. You're 15. Just go for it. No, they hated it. <laughs> they hated it. They... <laughs> well, you know what? To be fair, I, I think they didn't like it because they didn't, they just didn't know. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, they didn't like understand for... it. Yeah. It's something they don't understand. And also something that like they, you know, they just wanted me to be, to be okay in life, I guess. And like, if they're looking at that, they, they don't, they're there like, wasn't... so are you going to live at home forever now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I almost did, but. Well, you were touring, I mean, you were touring. <laughs> yeah. But for them, it's like, they, they didn't know any DJs. They yeah. didn't know. I mean, we didn't, we didn't, we're not an entertainment family. So there weren't even like people in our, in our immediate circle who were like successful, you know, a producer or an actor or a musician or anything right. like that. You can bring home like mix master Mike to talk to them and let them know. Hey, babe, this is big. Like it's totally cool. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be like, get this guy out of here. Like, DJ Kubert's here. He just really wants to let you know, like it's cool. It's a good career. <laughs> and it's funny cause they actually did meet them, but like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Uh, so, but, but like, but fast forward, is there? I know. So that I mean, that's like a whole other conversation. Like trying to get your Asian totally. parents to understand your dreams and <laughs> make you happy and fulfill <laughs> you may not be like you know uh, sitting at a desk all day. And uh, yeah, I, I've talked to many a fellow Asian American, mm-hmm. and you know, to like go through that that journey. But it's kind of like, well, you brought us to America, right? So I know what you, you wanted expect. us here, right? <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't have exposed us to everything if you wanted us to just be whatever so but but i mean but do they love it now do they get a kick out of seeing they love like, it your now visuals and yeah i mean i think when, when you do things that they that is sort of in their you know peripheral like i i, I got a, a little baby cameo in a movie they were psyched. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Then you were their son again. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, look who, look who's here. Like, uh, but I mean, but you're right though. They, they instill this like work ethic and drive in us. Yes. They, but you know, you, you can't like force where it goes. Yeah. Like, it's going to do what it does. Um, but yeah, they, they've, they, they've, since come to understand what's going on and they see sort of like what the possibilities are and uh they they love it now my my dad is hilarious like he'll go anytime he sees a dj anywhere because there's djs everywhere now oh, you yeah. know he'll go up and and he'll say hey do you know my son and you know it's like, <laughs> and, like, and they're like obviously yeah it's a dj McDonald's and they're like course, you know. well a lot of them are like my friends anyways so like yes <laughs> yes mr wong we know yeah <laughs> That's so funny. Well, but it's nice to finally have them come around to being the proud parents and embrace because, you know, it is kind of a thing where a lot of parents don't always get on board with the choices Mm -hmm. that their kids make. And it's unfortunate, you know, they can't see past that, but it's awesome that they can see you happy and thriving. I mean, I guess it does help that you're not still in the basement. Like, dad, I just need to buy this one more record. (laughs) This is my big break, I swear. Yeah, I think it helps that you are successful. So that's probably a thing too. But um, but so what is next for for you? What's next for Mike Brown that you can share unless there's some tough secret project that uh Uh, there's some secret stuff but there's also just like i i I just keep going with with what like you know obviously the touring i've been so lucky to be able to be the far sides dj and that's another you know i grew up listening to their i they raised me yeah i mean like it's crazy that like that's you know and they and they get they get the whole uh visual thing and we just have a lot of fun Mm -hmm. on tour and uh, they're they're actually putting on their first festival um, October sixth. Oh, so, cool. Okay. Yeah, and so obviously I'll be there. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, working on uh, more more remixes. I've been lagging on the remixes recently on mm-hmm. on YouTube, but you know I kind of needed a break uh, because uh, for those that don't know, guys, like visual like video edit is brutally like time-consuming <laughs> it is very time-consuming and especially, especially for what you're doing 
which yeah, is so timing going... everything to music. And, and um, so I do encourage everybody to check it out and then let us know which one was your favorite because there's some there's a little something there for everybody. There certainly is. Yeah, yeah. I'm a nerd. So. Me too. I, I'm, I'm total geek out on a lot of these sessions. So I'm all about it. I loved it. I loved it. Loved it. Loved it. I, I didn't have the time to go through all of them yet, you know, but um, but I definitely love the direction and I, I love what I see there. It's pretty cool. Thanks. I, very, 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 very cool. So, well, Mike, this has been an awesome conversation. I actually learned a lot about the DJ world and the culture of the DJ, you know, uh, lifestyle. And um, mm -hmm. I definitely wish you the best. And I hope to see many more of your trailers and um, your audio visual, you know, creations. Thank you. I look forward to making more of them. <laughs> All right. So everybody just check, check out his YouTube channel. I'll link everything here and you can see that awesome uh Iron Man 2 trailer that got so much attention from uh, Mr. John Favreau himself. So thank you, Mike, for joining me on Culture Chat today. Thanks, Mimi. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to Culture Chat and hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please subscribe and rate my podcast. Feel free to leave me suggestions or send an email to Mimi at culturechatpodcast.com or follow me on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook.